In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and king Pekah, son of Ramaliah of Israel, went up to attack Jerusalem, but could not mount an attack against it. When the house of David heard that Aram had allied itself with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. Because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia, because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Ramala has plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and cut off Jerusalem and conquer it for ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, no longer a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. And if you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. So in the season of Advent, it's also a season of gift giving. So today I start out the scripture reading with a gift to our liturgist Aaron. I will read the first part of our Matthew text for today. So friends, hear the word of God for us from Matthew chapter 1. On account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was a father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was a father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was a father of Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. 
So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David, David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as a wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Fear is a powerful force. It has the power to stop you in your tracks. It has the power to trap you in your past. It has the power to stop you from exploring new directions. It has the power to blind you to hope. And it has the power to kill your spirit. Years ago, I had the honor of baptizing an elderly man in his 90s. He'd been a faithful church grower, uh, goer for most of his adult life, but he'd never been baptized. Why? Well, somewhere along the line, he got taught that baptism, in a sense, purchased you forgiveness for all of your sins up to that point. Nothing passed. And if you died with unforgiven sins, then you would not go to heaven. You would not be with God for eternity. So he lived pretty much his entire adult life in fear of dying with unforgiven sins. Fear is a powerful, debilitating factor in so many people's lives. You know anybody who hasn't been happy in their job and always dreamed of starting their own business and going out on their own but never took that step because they were afraid? Maybe you're the one who's afraid. Have you done something you're now ashamed of and you don't want anybody else to know about it because if, if they know about it, they may not like you anymore. They may turn away from you. They, they may think about you differently. And so out of fear of your secret becoming known, you, you keep people at arm's length. How's that working for you? Fear is a powerful force. It can even stop you from believing in yourself. It can stop you from believing that you have a future that is different or better than your past. Do you know what one of the most common things that God says to people in all of Scripture? One thing. Let me tell you how Ahaz heard it. In the 8th century BCE, Judah was under siege by their sister nation of Israel and the nation of Aram. Isaiah was very descriptive about the impact this had on King Ahaz and the people of Judah. He said that, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. They were terrified. It was that simple. They were terrified. The first thing God wants Isaiah to say to Ahaz is, don't be afraid. We all know how pointless it is to tell someone who's afraid not to be afraid. King Ahaz didn't put much stock in that advice from Isaiah 
and God. So God said, well, ask for a sign. Anything you want, I will do for you to show you that you can trust me. You don't have any need to be afraid. And Ahaz refused. He was given an a opportunity that I think all of us would just love to have, and Ahaz refused it. The excuse he gave, or the reason he gave, was, who am I to put God to the test? But I think he was too afraid. I think he was too afraid to get his hopes up. So what did God do? God gave him a sign anyway. Not an army of angels in the sky, not a lightning bolt to come out of heaven and, and incinerate all of his enemies, but a child. A child will be born, the prophet said. Before that child is old enough to eat solid food, the nations that threaten you will be gone. And the name of that child? Emmanuel. God is with us. God is in the midst of our fears. There will be a tomorrow. Let's take a minute and look at that Gospel of Matthew. It begins with one of our traditional Christmas stories that, that we hear on Christmas Eve, the story of Joseph finding out that Mary is pregnant and he's not the dad. And the angel telling him, it's okay. Your child is of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God. But we often skip over the beginning of that story, the genealogy, for obvious reasons. It's a tongue twister to say all of those names. But that's a very powerful genealogy. It includes Tamar, who had children with Judah. But you see, Tamar wasn't married to Judah. Tamar was married to Judah's eldest son. But his eldest son died before having kids. And in those days, that if one son died without children, then the next son would take the widow as his wife, and their firstborn would then be attributed to the, the deceased son so that the name would be continued on. Well, Judah's eldest son dies. So Judah gives Tamar his next son, and make a very long story short, his next son did not do what he was supposed to do, and he died, and Judah did not want to give his youngest son to Tamar. He was afraid his youngest son would also die. And so he just sends her away, sends her back to her family, says basically, yeah, I'll be in touch with you later. Never did. So Tamar, she's abandoned, she is shamed, by being kicked out of her home there. And so to claim her rights and get justice for herself, she tricks Judah into sleeping with her and getting her pregnant. Didn't realize the genealogy was quite so interesting, did you? There's, of course, King David. David is like the high point of the list of kings, but David is the one who raped Bathsheba and then had her husband killed to cover it up. There was Ahaz, the same Ahaz that we read about in the Isaiah text. Ahaz had Nabal killed because Nabal refused to sell him a garden plot. He refused to sell some land, and he paid for it with his life. And then there's Manasseh. Manasseh was reportedly so corrupt that the Scriptures tell us he is the reason that God ultimately decided that the nation would be sent off into exile in Babylon for 70 years. Not the most upstanding list of ancestors. Well, I think one reason that Matthew includes that is, is one, he was writing his gospel for people who came out of the Jewish tradition, and it was one way of saying, Jesus is one of you. He is from this line of kings. And there's also a prophecy that the Messiah will come from the line of David. And so here you have the lineage that Jesus comes from the line of David. But woven through that genealogy are a whole bunch of backstories of people who have been wronged, of elites who abuse their power, of kings who turn their backs on God. And yet, God was with them. 
God was with them before Jesus was born. God was with them when they raped and killed and oppressed. God did not give up on them at that point, and God did not abandon them when they were in exile in Babylon. What do I love about this genealogy? This is what love looks like, concretely, in the flesh. When we talk about love coming down at Christmas, this is it. When our behaviors are ugly and unfaithful, God sticks with us. When we don't deserve it, God sticks with us and says, you still have a future worth living. Come, follow me. Both Jesus and the baby born in Ahaz day scream from the heavens that no matter our past, God is still with us. Fear and love are often at odds. You know, fear traps us in our past, blocks our ability to believe that the future can be any different. It hinders our ability to trust. It is love lived in the flesh that has the power to break through fear and helps us to see that there is a tomorrow. If Christmas is about nothing else, it's about that. It's about love in the flesh, that kind of love where God said, no matter what, I am with you and there is nothing you can do that will ever chase me away. I think of Christmas as God's neon sign of saying, I see the ugliness in your life. I see the fear that holds you back. I see the fear that paralyzes you. And I'm with you. I'm in your life. And I will never abandon you. So don't be afraid. Have courage. Walk with me. Because you have a future with hope. That's Christmas. Now, it's one thing to hear me say that. It's one thing to read that in the words on a page in our Bibles. The reality is, is that when our fear is deep-seated, when it has been there a long time, love doesn't just break it apart and make it vanish overnight. It can take time for love to cast out fear. But little bits, it does. And the more different ways we experience it, the quicker it breaks through the walls of fear in our lives and opens us up until we realize we're in a better place. And we aren't even always sure how we got there. This Christmas, I pray that you know that kind of love in your life. Because we all have fears, whether we want to admit to them or not. We all have things that scare us to death. We all have secrets that we don't want anybody else to know about. I pray that you know the kind of love in your life that confirms for you that God is with you no matter what. I pray that you find the courage to confront your fears, to risk new endeavors, and to grow from your past. That... Um, that elderly man I mentioned earlier that I baptized when he was in his 90s, he actually lived to be 98, some four or five years after I finally baptized him. But here's the beauty of it. After all of those decades of living in fear of God, in fear of death, he didn't have any fear in those last years of his life. Somehow, something happened in that sacrament of baptism that made him realize that God really does love him no matter what. That he really does belong to God no matter what. Even with sins, he has not confessed or asked for forgiveness for. He died knowing that God was with him and always had been. I pray when you are afraid, you find strength in knowing that you are not alone, that God is with you no matter what. But I also pray that you would be a sign of that kind of love to somebody else. I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know which is harder, putting aside our fear, 
to embrace new things, to envision a new future, to forgive ourselves, to trust. That, you know, that's, that's pretty hard. Is that harder than being a sign of that kind of love to somebody else? I know in dealing with our own fears, it can almost seem insurmountable. If I'm not going to be afraid of my past, then I have to deal with my past. And that's a pretty scary thing to do sometimes. If I'm not going to be afraid of the future, then I have to be willing to step out of my safe place and move. And that asks for courage as well. But if I know God is with me, then I have strength to draw on. I can find courage in God's love to look at my past, to deal with it, and to move beyond it. But it's not easy, and it is scary. But it can be just as hard to help somebody else find that way out as well. Loving others as God loves us, enough to be with them in their fears and their shame and their mess, to let them know that they don't have to be afraid of us seeing that, that could be pretty hard too. Because it means we have to love them like God loves us, which means we can't judge them. Which means we have to accept their warts and their sins and everything. It means we have to embody the truth of God's words don't be afraid. So they are not afraid with us. We cannot reinforce their shame or their fears. And it means we have to support them as they take those tentative steps beyond their wall of fear out into the light. It is not easy. It takes energy, physical, emotional, spiritual, and it takes time. We have to know that going in. If we want to be this kind of love for somebody else, a sign for somebody else, we just got to know it's going to ask a lot of us. But if we're willing to do that for someone else, not only do we help that person experience the life God intends for them, you know what the really wonderful thing about it is? It helps us get beyond our fears as well. It helps us trust even more that when God says, you don't need to be afraid, we don't need to be afraid helps us trust even more that when God says, I am with you, that God really is with us. I hope you take some time this week to watch the movie Girls on the Wall because that's one example of this kind of love in real life. One teacher walking with those juvenile girls in prison, believing in them enough for them to believe in themselves and find a new future. That's what God does for us. Fear is a powerful thing, but it will never be as powerful as the love of God, the God who says, I am here and I am with you. May you know that love in your life when you are afraid, and may you be a sign of that love to others when they are afraid. Amen. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org or find us on Facebook.